You know, at the start of this pandemic, the WHO had said speed is of the essence, not perfection when you're dealing with these lockdowns and getting it under control. When it comes to lifting the restrictions, should there be more of an abundance of caution than what we're seeing? Oh, I think um, as, when it comes to lifting, there is an abundance of caution. I, I believe Victoria is heading for uh, and has actually very large numbers of tests going on. Um, I've just heard that I think our group alone, uh, and there are many other groups testing now because we bought time uh, by, by locking things down, I think our group alone did more than 2,000 and tests, is doing more than 2,000 tests a day. I think we got two positives and they were from known uh, risk, uh, at-risk people who, who were in quarantine in hotels due to returning from overseas travel or, or some travel. Professor, we are just hearing President Trump speaking in the US uh, to media saying that Gilead is pushing fast when it comes to its coronavirus therapeutic. We know that there's been early data showing pretty positive indications of the efficacy of that therapeutics. Uh, also saying that he's confident that we'll have a virus vaccine by the end of this year. We've spoken to people saying that, you know, you can sort of fast track as much as you want, but it's simply not possible to be able to sidestep clinical trial protocols and processes to have a vaccine that quickly. Are you confident that there'll be a vaccine? Is that the magic bullet or is really working on better levels of, of serology testing, of antibody testing and therapeutics the way to go to broader reopening of economies? Look, we've got an enormous amount of resources thrown into it, so we should be doing all those things at absolutely maximum speed. But it's not impossible we will have a decent vaccine out by the end of the year. The British have this um, uh, uh, um, uh, chimp adeno vaccine from the Oxford group at the Jenner Institute. Uh, think about it. When you're going to test an antiviral vaccine in a, in, a, in a human population where the virus kills people, you have to first do some safety testing to see that the vaccine is safe in experimental animals when you challenge them with virus. So once you've done that, the next thing you have to do, and that can be done very quickly, and it's already been progressed through for the British vaccine. So once you've done that, you then start to put it into very small numbers of people to see if there's any safety issue, and then you escalate the numbers of people. Now, basically, the only way you can test whether there's any risk when people are infected with the virus, if they've been given the vaccine, is to have progressively larger numbers of people out there vaccinated and watch what happens when they get infected or if they get infected. So that process could probably go very, very quickly, depending on what level of risk people are can, uh, prepared to take. And uh, I don't think, think that it's unrealistic to think we would have a, a, a vaccine later this year. The, the big issue will be, of course, making enormous amounts of it if it looks to be successful. Yeah, mass production, not to mention the fact that they do need to reach the poorer developing economies, right? So if you take all of that into account, then how long would it take for there to be free movement of travel around the world if you get the vaccine in these developed economies, but they don't reach these emerging economies, really, it puts everybody at risk again? Uh, yes, I, I think free movement around the world is, is an issue, but the people who move around the world are not poor people in developing economies, usually in large numbers. I mean, you make sure if the vaccine works, if it is effective, it is protective, then you make sure that anyone who's getting on an international flight has a vaccination certificate and that uh, basically it would even be better if they'd been tested to see what levels of antibodies they had. That, that would be a strategic and policy decision. But there's no reason once you had a vaccine that, that you did not protect people. There's no reason why those people shouldn't start to travel again, as far as I can see. Not my field of expertise, but I would ask the epidemiologist. And Professor, what are your thoughts about even before a vaccine getting some sort of immunity passport based on antibodies? Because it seems the research is yet not clear on whether antibodies actually mean immunity. Personally, I'd be pretty confident they do. 
I think there's a lot of confusion around this because people tested uh, people late after infection and they were finding evidence of virus present by, by what we call the PCR test, which is a test that tests the viral genome. Now, we do know with this virus that we can get persistence of virus genetic material in the individual, but there's no evidence of infection, uh, for instance, in stool samples. So I think that's what was happening. They were interpreting, some were interpreting this as reinfection. I was just interpreting as persistence of virus somewhere in the body. I, I, I would be surprised if the people who've got antibody and are circulating a reasonable level of antibody are not protected against reinfection for at least a year or so. What we don't know, of course, because this is a very new virus, is how long that protection will last. And, of course, once we start to test a vaccine, as we escalate up, in the human population, we'll get a pretty quick answer, I think. If we're testing in endemic areas where there's a lot of virus spread, we'll get a pretty quick answer on whether it's protective or not. Professor, are we likely to see another pandemic like this in future years? I, I think that's a good bet that we will. I mean, you know, you can't... Uh, you can't predict these things as we now understand. I think we, uh, I think the Chinese and uh, various people who are uh, sort of operating live animal mark markets must be looking at this very seriously uh, to reduce that risk. Uh, and uh, it's clear those, those are risky, uh, and we need to, and they're risky also for influenza. The live bird markets have been a major risk for influenza over the years and there's been processes of opening up live bird markets, closing them down and all the rest of it. I think we need to get rid of that particular aspect of culture if we possibly can, but it's really up to the Asian countries to do that. We don't have that sort of structure in most Western countries. But um, you can never tell where a pandemic will come from. Uh, and we do have this international organisation uh, that was CEPI, which was... Um, uh, funding the manufacture of vaccine platforms uh, to to deal with this. And some of that's now gone into vaccine trial very quickly as a result of the work they funded. And I think we need a similar program to develop antiviral drugs against all the major groups of viruses that are potential threats. We have them for the influenza viruses. We should have had them for the coronaviruses and we didn't, but I think that's something we could do. There are other potential virus threats out there. I think we should cover that whole spectrum. So I think we can prepare ourselves better, and we'll also have a much better idea. This is an enormous uh, a training exercise, apart from anything else, in how to deal with a pandemic when we have modern medicine and modern control measures. You mentioned China and, and sort of the origins of the virus and you continue to see the Trump administration, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, insisting that they have evidence that this is, if not a man-made virus, at least one that originated in a lab in Wuhan. Are you fairly confident that the origins of the virus came, I guess you can say, organically from within these wet markets? Uh, that was the original story that we were hearing. Uh, we heard it from the epidemiologist Ben Cowling, who's in Hong Kong, and he's a very uh, uh, he's a great epidemiologist. But I don't know what information he was based on, uh, basing that on. But the first story we heard that it was coming out of the seafood market at Wuhan, which is where the wet market is. Then there have been other, apart from various scurrilous suggestions of American scientists bringing it in and releasing it, or or or, or this sort of nonsense. Um, we, we've been hearing some speculation from China and also from some of the European virologists that though it may have come out of nature by a bat and by another species, it may be another species of wildlife and it may not have come through the wet market. So that's one thing that the virologists could look at over, the, over time by sampling more wildlife in China. Now, what Trump and Pompeo are saying at the moment is they believe it's a lab escape, and they say they have evidence. Now, now um, their intelligence people have come out and said, we don't think, uh, we, we're pretty satisfied this is not a genetically engineered virus, okay? So it, it's not as though it's been in a lab with people messing around mm. with it. But you couldn't tell the difference between a virus that came straight out of nature 
and a virus that was isolated in the lab and worked on for a little time with nothing particularly done to it that escaped from the lab. So if they have evidence of virus escape, and I've heard nothing of that that comes from their intelligence agency, um, then I, I hope that they'll uh, publish their information, make it available and let us all look at it because we'd like to know that. It's not really important. Right. It's not going to make the slightest difference to how we handle this pandemic. It's something for the future. The, mm. the Chinese gave out the virus sequence early, which is what we needed to develop tests and start developing vaccines. So the whole thing is an exercise in distraction to do with the next United States election. Sure, and uh, it's, for November. Uh, it's pretty pointless for anyone else pretty pointless for anyone else to buy into it and in fact it's very stupid.